So today we want to talk more about personal planning and, and, and your lives in general. So I want to do a quick survey. Stand up if you are currently in the job that you intend to remain in until you retire. This half of the room <laughs> is that group, all right? Stand up if you are currently taking classes or a class to advance your career. All right? Keep standing. Now, for the other one, stand up if you plan on taking additional classes to advance your career. All right, very good, okay. You guys can sit down. So stand up if you think you are within 10 years of retiring. People just, did, did you see how people jumped? Okay, now stand up if you wish you were within 10 years of retiring, right? That's it, right? Absolutely. So the interesting thing, uh, there's a gentleman named Patrick Palmer that, that has a quote that I use all the time when I'm talking to students. And that quote is, before you can tell your life what you intend to do with it, you have to listen for what it intends to do with you. In other words, when we're talking to students or prospective students or even students in college or even some of young alumni, we want them to think about what's going to make them happy in life, what's going to make them passionate about what they want to do. You know, we get tons of students that come to Mississippi State that major in engineering, and the only reason they major in engineering is because they may have scored a 30 on the ACT, and everybody they talked to said, oh, you're good in math, you should major in engineering. But some of those aren't necessarily passionate about that. So the interesting thing about that quote, though, is it really applies to anybody. Before you can decide what you want to do with your life, you need to listen to what your life wants to do with you next. So what are you going to do next, you know? Um, and for the group that stood up that's taking classes, you may have a plan. But for that group over here that's getting ready to, to retire, it's not, it's not going to end. You're not just going to retire and go sit on the front porch and rock away, there's something beyond retirement. There's something beyond retirement. I sit on the board of directors of a, of a group called the Cooperative Education and Internship Association. Walt Disney World is a, a big player in that group and they hosted us this past year down at Disney World for a board meeting and, and have really every year for about the past five years. And I, I, I went in there and it's really nice because they put us up in the Grand Floridian, which is a really nice place to stay if you ever get a chance to go. But there's a gentleman there, he's a little short guy, um, older gentleman, older, probably knocking on mid-70s, named Frank. And the first time I went, I saw Frank and I'm thinking, Frank, yeah, this is, Frank's kind of an older gentleman to be out here hustling bags and checking in people. I struck up a conversation with him, which I'm prone to do. My, my wife's sitting right back there. If you ask, if you ask her, we'll go to Kroger, go to Walmart. And I end up over here talking to a student. Now, what are you majoring in? What are you, you know? So I, I do that all the time. But I'm talking to Frank and learn about Frank. Frank has an MBA. He's a retired bank president from the Northeast. Came down, retired like a lot of people in the Northeast do because it snows there. Came down to Orlando to retire. So he and his wife traveled around for about a year, and then they started looking at each other and going, you know, Frank's smart enough to realize the longer he sits at the house, the longer his honeydew list is going to get. So he said, I am going to find something to do. Had a friend that worked at Disney. Disney hires a lot of retirees. He went to work for Disney thinking, well, I'll try it, see what it's like. He said, you know, for the past 10 years, I've been coming in every day. I work four hours a day, five days a week. He said, my supervisor, who's 50 years younger than me, doesn't have to worry if I'm going to be here. So I'm always here, you know. Does his thing four hours a day. says he greets people, talks to people. He gets to move luggage in and out. He said, that's my exercise for the week. I get to do that every day. It keeps me healthy, keeps me young. But that's my life after retirement. So 
You have to think about that. What is it that you want to do when you start to plan? Where is your career going? Fortunately, we're all here at the university. You can, you can think about those things. You can take classes. I think over 25% of my current staff took a class in the spring semester. About half my staff is, serves on a board, whether it's a, a statewide, regional, or national board um, of, of directors and involved in committees and organizations. So they build in their resume and their career that way. A large part of my staff volunteer and start for with the Women's Job Corps. Always thinking about what you can do. Carl Mack, who is the Mississippi State graduate, and he's the executive director of the National Society of Black Engineers. If you've never heard Carl speak and he ever speaks on campus, take the opportunity to go hear him. Wonderful speaker, wonderful speaker. But he tells students every time he gets in front of them that your life should always be in transition. You should never be content and happy, I'm here, this is what I want to do. Your life should always be in transition. Think about what am I going to do next? What do I want to do next? How can I make a difference in this world, in my life, in somebody else's life, but what can I do next? He said, because if you're thinking in that mode, then you're, you're also being an active learner. You're also doing things to, to help you advance in your career. You're doing things to help just build your inner self. And that's kind of what we all want to do, right? Is, is, is build our inner self and find a way to make a difference. So, as you think about those things, think about how you can do that. Maybe it is taking classes. Maybe it is volunteering. Um, but always being in that mode of transition. The other thing you have to be is, is, is be prepared. So, um, I need a volunteer on, on this outside row because it'd be hard to get Skip Jack to volunteer because then he had to crawl over 27 people to get out. So, volunteer right over here, just one. Oh, come on. I don't bite. Oh, come on. Come on up. So she's, she's going to come right up and tell us your name. So tell me your name. I'm Scott Maynard. Nicole Jackson. Nicole Jackson in the art department. All right, Nicole, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am originally from Chicago, Illinois. I joined Mississippi State University in February of 2015. I am officially an academic records assistant, but that means that I recruit and advise students. Um, I love talking to people, and I love having fun. All right. In the next five years, I would like to... I would like to be married, um, have children, what one child <laughs> um, and have earned my master's in public administration and I haven't decided what I want to do with that though yet. <laughs> so I chose to go into public administration because? Because I think it's important that we take an active role in how laws and policies are made. And um, I'm not 100% sure if I want to go into a government role or if I want to stay in higher ed, but that degree will help me on either side I want to go to. So as a city councilman, I'm going to tell you that that higher ed side is a lot less headaches. So <laughs> that is <mine. laughs> Um, in, the, in the long future, if I had to pick one career for me, it would be an ideal career I would like to I would like to help people mend their feelings. I feel like there's a lot of people who have these certain ideals and they want everybody else to have those ideals, which hinders diversity and inclusion. But if you give people the opportunity to express who they are without hurting themselves or you in the process, I think that would be awesome. So somewhere along the lines of the diversity and inclusion. Very good. Give her a hand.
So one of the things we talk about in, in our staff is, is because we're preaching this and teaching this to students all the time about sharpening your saw and continuing to, to grow and build, we all went through um, the, the seven habits of highly effective people. And if you've never read the book or gone through the training, it's excellent. So I don't know if you've done that or not, but I'm giving you a copy of the book. So oh. you can take that and thank you very much. Thank you. So the seven habits are, are, are pretty simple, but the fact that they're there, they make you think about what you want to do. The first habit is be proactive. So think about that as you wake up every morning. What can I do today to be proactive, to make my day better, to make somebody else's day a little bit better? And as you think about those things along the way, the second thing is begin with the end in mind. We push that a lot in our office because we're always constantly doing all these kind of events and activities. And I see Miss Donna over here with the Student Association. And they're always doing all these events and activities to, to, to generate interest. But we need to think about what do we really want to accomplish with this. The same with us as individuals. What is my ultimate goal? Is my ultimate goal is to finish that master's degree in public policy and be in a position where I can make a difference. What is that going to look like? And how can I put myself in a position to do that? And we'll speak to that in just, just one minute. But the third one is put first things first. Get those priorities in order along the way. The next one is think win-win. A lot of times when we're working with other groups, how can we all come out of this in, in, a, winning, in a winning position? I get that a lot on the city council. You know, how, how can we all win with this policy or this building project on campus? How can we bring around a win-win for everybody? And that's important because if you get to that mode where I win, but if I win, you lose, then you're not going to be able to build and sustain those long-term relationships. It can't be always a win-lose, lose-win. Competition is good and fun and important, but we can have competition and still all come out winners. Um, the next one is, is probably one of the hardest, and it is seek first to understand and then be understood. So we have to listen. We have to listen to ourselves. What are we good at? What do we want to do? Where can we make that difference? And then be understood. So seek first to understand and then be understood. The next two are, are, are two of my favorites in working with groups. Um, the second to last one is synergize. How can we as a group work together to make a difference? You know, in my office, I've got, I really have four offices. I have an office in Montgomery Hall. I've got a group in McCain Engineering. I've got a group in Bowen Hall, and I've got a group in Meridian. You know, bringing everybody together and then working on programs that are just as meaningful to engineers as they are to architecture students, or just as meaningful to ag students as they are to our art students, you know, because those, all those different students don't always think alike. And the employers that recruit them recruit differently. But we have to, to work together as a group to make sure we're giving everybody what they need. And finally, the last one, sharpen the saw. In other words, take the time to build your inner self. Now those that are taking classes, that's great. That's what you're doing. You're taking care of yourself. You're building your inner self. There's a lot of retirees out here that, that take classes. Two weeks ago, I got a phone call from an alum, and, and I answered the phone. The gentleman says, I want to know if y'all help alumni in the job search process. And I said, well, absolutely. We're here. We serve students from before they ever get to Mississippi State until, until they, they long after they graduate, until they retire. And he said, well, I said, I'm looking for a job. I said, okay. And we start talking. And he said, I graduated in 1971. I'm starting to do my math in my head thinking, I hope I'm not calling to, <laughs> to try to find the job, but I, you know, 40 plus years after I graduated. 
Um, but he was excited. He had retired, same as, as my friend down at Disney. He's just looking for something else to do. So constantly sharpening that saw. Now one of the other keys as we talk about setting these goals is to be in a position to be prepared. Be in a position to be prepared for that. One of the ways to do that is to have your resume constantly updated. You know, if you go 10 years and don't update that resume and then you go back and look at it and start trying to remember what you've done the last 10 years, whew, that's tough. Constantly have that resume updated because one of the things you'll find too is somebody may call you and say, hey, I know this position that, that, that you might be interested in. Do you have an updated resume? Well, you've got one. Plus, it forces you to constantly adjust it, build on it, and think about how you're going to market yourself. So constantly updating that resume. Second thing is networking. Constantly networking. So how do, how do we network? How do you guys network right now? What is your network? Conferences, excellent way to do it. Yeah. College, fairs. College fairs, good. The fun thing about conferences, I'll give you a sneak peek here. If you ever get a chance to volunteer, and there's always people call, you know, we need volunteers for our conference. Volunteer to work the registration table. If you work the registration table, you get to see every single person that attends that conference. They walk through. You're helping them. You get to meet everybody, and they remember you. You know, a day and a half later, you can you identify somebody you really want to connect with. You go up to them and say, "Hey, we met at registration." Oh yeah, registration, got it. That's a way to meet everybody. Fairs, career fairs, where they're building around a good way. How else? Professional associations. Professional associations, excellent. That builds your network. That network can then help you branch out for others. How many have a LinkedIn profile? Okay. Build that LinkedIn profile. We use now in the Career Center LinkedIn all the time. Give you a perfect example. My son just moved from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to Jacksonville, Florida. He started a new job in Jacksonville. He found the job through connections on LinkedIn. He saw the job advertised online and, and did what, what we always do in the Career Center. He did a search, advanced search, typed in under company, that company's name that he's going, wanted to go to work for and ultimately is working for, and then typed under school, Mississippi State University. 68 alumni currently worked or had worked for that company. I, I personally knew three of them, just looking down this list. Oh, I remember that student, that student, that student. He emailed them, reached out, said, hey, I'm thinking about applying for a job with your organization. Do you have any tips you can give me? Talked to all of them, got, got advice, went through the application process, the job process, the interview process. Part of the interview process was they sent him out on a, a field call to talk to professors um, within the, the group that he was going to be representing at a random school. They picked the school, so he had no idea what school it was going to be um, or who, who he was going to be talking to. He had to set up all the discussions. So the person he was talking to kind of walked him through this process and saying, you know, when you get this call, kind of be expecting it. So he, he was ready for that. You know, going in blind may not have been. But it's so easy to reach out into that network through LinkedIn. Had another student that was in professional golf management two years ago that his last semester decided he didn't want to go into golf. He wanted to go into finance. Fortunately, he had gotten a finance minor, but he wanted to go in finance and he wanted to work in New York City. You know, we don't have a lot of New York banks flying down to Starkville to recruit. Just not happening right now. Um, but we did the same thing. Found about a dozen alumni in New York working in finance, keyword search finance, 
New York City, it came up. He reached out to about a dozen of them. About six contacted him back. Three of those six interviewed him. One of those offered him a job. Um, again, it's just the network. Just the network. So um, constantly work on building that network and building, building your brand as well. Uh, students that go to D.C., uh, we've got a group of alumni in D.C. We affectionately refer to them as the Mississippi Mafia because they're kind of in the underground in the D.C. world, but they take care of our students. And it doesn't matter if they're Mississippi State grad, Ole Miss grad, Southern grad, Jackson State grad, Delta State grad. They all look out for the other Mississippi students that are up there and really take care of them when they're in the job search process. So. Again, just finding those little niches to build that network. Um, and then deciding what it is you want to do. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be 10 years from now? And start planning, how can I get there? You know, Some of us want to be retired, right? And what's that going to look like? What's that going to look like in 10 years for us when we're retired? Won't be me, but for others, what's it going to look like? And then what do you want to do? You know, where, where can you make a difference in, in setting those goals out? So, how do you prepare for the next step? We talked about the resume. We talked about gaining the right experience. Talked about getting on those committees, networking, working those events like conferences, like fairs. So what about after that? How many in here have kids that are in 12th grade or less? That's a second career, right? <laughs> Chasing them around? Um, you know, what happens when they graduate? My youngest just graduated from college. You know, Sandy and I, when the first one went to school, they started talking about, oh, you're going to have that empty nest syndrome. We, we realized early on it was empty nest celebration at our house. So, <laughs> you know, you had that empty nest syndrome for about 10 minutes, and after that you're looking around, especially when the second one went off and we were at the house by ourselves. You know, you looked around and you go, well, this is pretty nice. You know? For us, the second one went off to, to, to school. Uh, two days later, the first one said, you know, I think I'm going to move home my senior year. We're like, oh. Really? <laughs> really? You, know, you, you, you can't say no because you're a parent, but you think about it for a minute. You know, how could I? No, I guess not. I guess not. Well, that's a thought. But yeah, it, the, your, the point in your life where you are makes a big difference as well. You know, you want to have kids, right? You know, I want to get married, have kid, 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 duh. <laughs> One, kid, does, um, But that changes your whole world at that point, you know, for, for good, for raising the kid and all that. But from a time standpoint, you know, I remember getting my master's, sitting in a recliner with, with the first child asleep on my, on my chest, and I'm trying to read economics, you know. And, um, but it changes your world, right? And you've you got to get through that transition as well. So as you set goals and think about your life, there's other factors come into play with that as well. Um, how we interact with students in setting goals. You know, I ha we have, I have what I think is one of the best jobs in the world. All the students that come into our office, for the most part, are happy and excited, right? I don't know who, anybody in here working housing? See, <sighs> you know, not everybody walks into the housing office, especially the freshmen are happy and excited. Or student affairs, Ms. Donna could probably tell you, you know, not everybody that walks through the doors, but when they come into the career center, a lot of times they're saying, hey, I got this job, or I got accepted to med school, or I'm going to law school, or they're usually always happy or excited. So we're, we have a fun, fun place to work. Um, but it's always great and it's always fulfilling seeing that you've helped someone else. It's something you may have said or done, and that's the beauty of working on a college campus. We may have helped make a difference in a student's life or multiple students' lives. But then you have to, again, turn that around to look at yourself. What can I do to help my life? 
what can I do to help better my life going forward? Because you have to take care of yourself first. Because you don't want to get burned out if you're chasing all those little kids around you and you're thinking, oh gosh, I don't know if I can get up in the morning. <laughs> you know, long night, one stayed up all night. Man, I get up in the morning. You got to take care of yourself. So, what about second careers? Skip Jack right there. Plays in a band, right? Used to. Sometimes. Sometimes. A little second career. Jeffrey Rupp's over in the College of Business. You can go see Jeffrey playing in a band. What are your interests outside of, of work as well? You know, that could be important in helping you identify who you are. Um, so let me ask you this. Throw out some answers. In your ultimate job, what, what would you like to do? Help others? Okay. How would that look? What would you be doing? Probably, well, my goal in mind is more of an um, outreach for ladies. First start. Okay. Young ladies that have had a child or a school. Okay. And just need a first start. All right. And how, how would you go about helping them? First of all, I am encouraging them to be better for themselves so they can be better for their child. And motivate them to go back to school, encourage them to do other things as well. Okay. Is there a group that you would work with that does that now? I don't. Well, I will. Yeah. We're coming back to that one. Who else? What's another ideal career you'd like to do? Expose um, at risk students and people to things that they wouldn't necessarily see on a normal basis. So, like, they can take field trips to bigger cities, um, explore restaurants and travel, kind of get them excited outside of what their normal experience is. Okay. Y'all could work together. It's interesting you bring that up. So one of the things that, that we see, whether you're looking for yourself or looking for others, is especially for first gen students or for students that come from rural areas or students that come from, from a, um, a lower to lower middle income family, is finding the means to be able to see the things that they haven't seen before. You know, fortunately for, for Co-op students, about half the employers we work with in co-op offer free housing for the students. If they didn't do that, students could not afford to go. Because a lot of students can't afford to pick up from Starkville, Mississippi, move to Houston, Texas, and have a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand bucks to shell out in deposits to, to get an apartment, much less get there. Um, so finding a way to match them up with an employer that provides housing is critical in that role <coughs> because then we can get them there. You know? A lot of the scholarships that the university is offering now and a lot of the scholarships that the Development Foundation officers are negotiating include funds for things like study abroad. Again, giving a student an opportunity to do something that they otherwise would never get a chance to do. Um, we have a, a newly expanding role in, in undergraduate research on this campus. Getting students involved in the research aspect of their particular major early on so they can see things that they probably have never been exposed to. We have a program, we teach a class in our office called Career and Life Planning. And we work with a software program called Road Trip Nation. Part of the Road Trip Nation um, curriculum is to have students go out and interview an individual in a field that they think they would ultimately like to work in. A lot of the students go into that interview thinking, I'm going to go in here and knock this out in 15 minutes and I'm going to be done. A lot of those students end up spending 
a half day or a full day with that individual because once that conversation starts flowing, they start learning things about that person. We had a student that went down to the Gulf Coast and interviewed an artist that lives in Ocean Springs. Same thing. She wanted to, to open up her own art um, boutique and um, she was just going to go in, talk to this person because this person lived and, and down there and we connected them up. She thinks, she told the group when she was presenting, she said, you know, I thought I was going to zip in, zip out. She said, I spent the day there because I found out that person that ran that store was so much like me. And they started telling me stories about their past. Um, and, and you could see that. And you can just see as these students do this, the light bulb that goes off. But they also, learn, and a lot of times, learn about careers that they never even knew existed. The other neat part about Road Trip Nation is, if you've ever seen, I don't know if you've ever seen the green RV parked out in the, in the foyer out here between the, what was the post office and the union. But every year, Road Trip Nation takes students from all across the country, puts them in a green RV, and sends them across the United States, traveling in the green RV, interviewing um, CEOs, um, band members, high profile people in government and asking them about their road trip. How did you get to where you are today? And then they put all of those on the web. But it's interesting and it's always exciting for students to see, you know, people don't just go to school and become a CEO. A lot of times there's a winding road to get there. And a lot of times that winding road started out, I started out in college, I flunked out. I went to work somewhere else, then came back, and then my road started going up. Um, and students need to see that. Students that you're talking about back there need to see that people can be successful after they fail. Because so many times they don't realize that. They don't realize that that opportunity exists after they've made a bad decision at 17 or 18 years old or flunked out of school the first time along the way. Um, if you ever get a chance to hear, hear Miss Keenum talk about her path versus Dr. Keenum's path um, in, in their life and where they got there, it, it, it's interesting. She and I have team talked to students before, to groups of students, and she'll put it on the chalkboard or the whiteboard and Dr. Keenum's is kind of a, a, a pretty straight line. He got his PhD, DC, Department of Ag, back to, to well, Dr. Um, Senator Cochran, Department of Ag, back to Mississippi State. Miss Keenum's is all over the place. I mean, it's here, out, you know, in government, out of government, consulting, back, mom, kid, you know. Um, but it's interesting to hear her tell that story to students too because the, the contrast is so different, but they both ended up being very successful. So as you're helping those students, as you're helping yourself, think about that. Any questions? What questions do you have? Y'all are such a quiet group. I know you're all excited. You're thinking about, gosh, I can't wait. In two weeks, all the students come back. and it's <laughs> It's going to be so easy. There's not going to be any parking issues. The roads aren't going to be crowded. I can go and eat in a restaurant anytime I want to. Can you, uh, can you recommend like websites on how to write the best resumes these days? You know, it, it's interesting, and, and certainly our website, if you go to our handbook, we've got 17 pages in our handbook on how to write a resume, and there's all kinds for all different types of, of careers and and people, um, a lot of companies nowadays are, are using LinkedIn profiles. So it's not just your resume, it's actually really getting into detail and completing that LinkedIn profile. And now with the, with the onslaught of Google and Yahoo and big data, now there's, there's matching programs that match up resumes with potential jobs 
So we're now having to teach instead of just putting a resume together, making sure you've got the right keywords on your resume or the right keywords in your LinkedIn profile that are going to match with the keywords and the job description of the job that you're looking for so that it'll put your resume higher than somebody else's in the queue. Um, um, so it's just schematics like that. But, but yes, we can certainly help you. And, and we're happy to review resumes in our office for, for faculty and staff as well. Sure. If we wanted to have our resume review, who would we ask to see? Um, you can just email it to me. Yep. And I'll, I'll get that. Be happy to do that. So, um, if, if you're talking to students as well in our office, in addition to resumes, we do mock interviews with students. We do seminars on job search strategies. Uh, every September we do a Dress Your Best seminar. Um, that, that talks about not only how to address for an interview, but really how to prepare for an interview, how to make sure that your, your students now, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Periscope, Snapchat, is, is acceptable because every employer, whether they'll tell you that or not, are going to go out and, and look at those things before they make a student an offer or before they make you an offer. Um, and we tell students all the time, we, we hope you had a good trip on your spring break down in Cancun. We don't need to see all the pictures, right? Uh, be selective on what you're putting there uh, because once you put that up, it's there forever. You know, uh, if you want to do something interesting, Google your name. And see what are the about. common or lethal mistakes that those of us looking at subsequent career make? Um, so quick common mistakes are I've got a position open right now received 68 resumes for it um, probably six to ten of those the cover letter was addressed to somebody different than than the career center um, some of those had their, their objective for their career was to find a sales job. And they're sending the resume to, again, to the career center. So really, not paying attention to detail is, is really key in that. Um, the second thing, I think, is, is, is not working the job, not finding out before, researching the, the company, researching the job, understanding what they need um, prior to applying for the position or, or using your network to try to get in to, to get somebody that knows somebody that can get you into the system. You know, a lot of times jobs on this campus will open up in your offices, as in my office, when a professional position opens up in my office, we're getting over a hundred resumes. How do you filter through a hundred resumes? You know, you're going through and you go through that first cut and you have a, still a stack of 40, and then you're going through. And the secret, right, for you is you want to make sure your resume is one of the top three or top five out of that stack. So a lot of times it's, it's, it's making sure you've paid attention to detail. It's working your contacts of people you know to, to be able to do that. Um, and pay attention to the job description. So many times the job description will tell you exactly what they're looking for, right? Because if you sat on search committees, what do you do? You all, you all sit down in a room together and you go, okay, what are we looking for? We need somebody with good communication skills. All right, good communication skills. We, we, we need somebody that's been involved in outside organizations. Okay, let's put that down. Uh, we need somebody that, that and, and all of a sudden you come up with a list, right? So if you're applying for that job and you're reading that, you want to make sure in your resume it highlights some of those things. In your cover letter, you really highlight those items. You know, I've been involved in leadership roles on and off campus through in, you know, little sentences like that. So then when the committee is reading 
the cover letters and the resumes and they've got that little Excel spreadsheet beside them and they're going, okay, this is what we said we were looking for. Oh, they've got that. Yeah, they've got that. Yeah, they've got that. Oh, they're in the key pile. You know, so, attention to detail. Yes? There are a number of employers now that, that use like an electronic system. You fill out the black hole. Essentially, yeah. the application online. Yeah. And I was wondering whether or not it's still appropriate, because I've been asked, and I'm not sure I know the answer, is whether or not it's appropriate to to attach, in addition to potentially the option to attach your resume, um, the cover letter, even though it's not requested. So a lot of times, you can attach them as just one document. So in, in some, you know, you can only upload one document. So then the cover page would be page one of your resume and then page two, three, and four would, would follow that. So you can just upload one document to get it all in there. Another secret to that, though, is if you can identify the hiring manager or a person within HR, within that organization, it's, there's nothing wrong with mailing them a, a hard copy or emailing them a copy as well so that it, it gets in front of them one more time. So you're still recommending, even though they don't request it, and potentially don't want it, I don't know, because they're getting, instead of, because it's a big company or something, they're getting right. a thousand. Uh, applications for the same position that they may not want the cover letter. I don't know. I don't know what's appropriate anymore. It used to be that I, I, I would not. I would, yeah, and in most cases, I would still say include it. Send it. Yeah, yeah. Because you can tell so much more of your story there. Um, you know, so, it, you know, but it, everyone's different. A lot of times, the, the feedback we get from those online, you know, they, Again, if it's a big company with a big job, they get thousands. So then they're they're filtering by keyword. So really, the the software is what's filtering. But if if it's all in one document, it's going to look at your cover letter words just like your your resume words. So. Like USA Jobs. Oh gosh. Yeah. Now the other secret. So USA Jobs is the job posting board for for government jobs. What a lot of people don't know is that. A lot of those jobs are set up so that when they hit X number of applications, it just cuts off. Now, the, the applicant never sees that, so people are still applying. Um, but, you know, so we tell students, especially for uh, some of those really highly competitive internships, you know two days in advance when it's going to cut on. So you're there, and you've got all your information in, and as soon as it goes live, you... And, you get in. <laughs> so it's kind of like applying for admission to Mississippi State at midnight, you know. <laughs> it's just it's the same principle, yeah. yeah. So. Well, thank y'all very much. I sincerely appreciate it. Hope this was helpful to you.